Welcome back to Task and Purpose. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Unlike the rest of the world's superpowers, the Chinese military never signed on to the missile treaty banning short-range missiles. These treaties severely limited the United States and Russian short-range missile capabilities to under 300 kilometers. By refusing to sign on to the agreements, it allowed China to amass the world's largest missile force with over 1,400 short-range and intercontinental ballistic missiles that have ranges between 500 and 5,000 kilometers. Ranges that are banned under the 1987 INF Treaty that was signed by Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. China has an entire branch of their armed forces dedicated to rockets. The People's Liberation Army Rocket Force is in charge of organizing, manning, training their missile defense force. It is made up of 120,000 personnel and six ballistic missile brigades that are deployed independently throughout China. That's about the same size as the entire US military's infantry force. The United States has zero equivalent to this branch, and instead they choose to give their control of their very limited number of short-range ballistic missiles to the Army, and they split their cruise missiles between the Navy and Air Force. Each year, the United States Department of Defense publishes a document outlining what China's military is focusing their modernization efforts on. And missiles are cited as where the majority of China's funding is going within their defense industry. In 2020, for instance, the PLARF launched more than 250 ballistic missiles for testing and training, which is more than the rest of the world combined. So the DoD highlights here that a growing number of these rocket systems are mobile launch platforms. This is key to their strategy as we'll see in just a minute. Are these missiles designed for an offensive or defensive role? What are some of their major weaknesses and how were they originally invented? We'll find out in a minute, but first. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Pick from over 600 unique characters to fight in castles, dungeons, deserts, and temples. Let's see what kind of weapons they own. One of my favorite champions is Helior, who uses the Shunshine Halibird, or Lydia, the Death Siren, who uses the Siren's Whale, which helps your team, but poisons the enemy. And the whole raid community has been waiting for this a long time. Ultimate Death Knight is here. He's strong, he's powerful, and the best part is anyone can get him for free. All you have to do is log in and play raid for seven days between now and October 27th. Use promo code DKRISES. Level your new strongest champion all the way to level 50. Five star ascension. This month, a new dungeon, the Iron Twin Fortress was added. If you're good enough to take it down, you receive a prize in the form of a brand new feature. Awaken a champion and give them a blessing that changes how they perform in battle. This feature adds a whole new level Level of depth and variety to the game. Click the link in the description or scan my QR code on screen to download Raid Shadow Legends and get a unique bonus for $30. We're talking an epic free champion, Virgus, 200k silver, 1 energy refill, 1 XP boost, and 1 ancient shard. The PLA reforms in 2015 elevated the rocket force status to a full branch at that point, which is actually just a few years after North Korea did the same thing. The China Aerospace Studies Institute wrote a paper detailing the PLA rocket force. They sound like they might work for the CCP, but in reality, they're actually a US Air Force think tank whose whole job it is to research open source intel on China's missiles and present their findings to the government and the military. They claim the PLARF is the most misunderstood branch in the Chinese armed forces. Right in their executive summary, it sums up the monumental changes that have just happened here. Incredibly, between 2017 and late 2019, the PLARF added at least 10 new missile brigades. This unprecedented expansion from 29 to 39 brigades represented a more than 33% increase in size in only three years. Thus, the PLARF has evolved from a small, unsophisticated force of short-range and vulnerable ballistic missiles to an increasingly large, modern, and formidable force with a wide array of both nuclear and conventional weapons platforms. The concept behind China's missile strategy is called Anti-Access Aerial Denial, or A2AD. You'll see this everywhere when you read about Chinese military philosophy. The Chinese tactics are to deny the United States the freedom of movement anywhere near their coast. This was a very smart decision made by the Chinese military. I gotta say, they saw how the United States spent months amassing combat power in Kuwait, right outside of Iraq's borders. The US was able to set the conditions and shape the battlefield for success before the battle even started. 
They were able to stage tanks and aircraft safely outside the range of Iraq's missiles. Iraq, a much larger army, already lost the war before it even began. China saw this and learned from it. They realized they needed a specific type of weapon that would deny the United States military the ability to go wherever they pleased without the threat of attack. The real question is whether or not China can design and develop missiles that are accurate enough to hit an aircraft carrier while it's moving, a capability they are spending considerable resources on. In order to understand why China is investing so much money into upgrading their missile capabilities, we need to look at its history. The Daefang missile program started in the 1950s. At that time, China had just wrapped up World War II, and they had been severely clobbered by a brutal Japanese invasion and a brutal civil war with in their own country. Both conflicts happened simultaneously. After the war, China was badly mismanaged by its Communist Party leadership. In one such big mistake was a series of purges which imprisoned or killed off many of its intelligent academics. Sure, they had murked all the people who would threaten their rule and power, but they'd also murked anyone who was able to create advanced weapons for China's military. This meant China had to lean heavily on its communist friends in the Soviet Union. In 1950, China signed the Sino-Soviet Treaty of Friendship and Alliance. In doing so, the Soviet Union transferred the R-1, R-2, and RF-11F missiles to China, all of which were based closely on the German-made V-2 rocket. The reason they were designed closely to the German V-2 was because when World War II finished, Russia gathered up as much Nazi rocket technology and scientists as they could. With these Russian rockets, the Chinese were able to start their own ballistic missile program. Thus the Dongfang in English or East Wind in Chinese was born. The first Dongfang missile or DF-1 was a short range ballistic missile. It was a licensed copy of the Soviet R-1. Strangely used alcohol as fuel and liquid oxygen as an oxidizer. It could carry a 500 kilogram bomb over a range of 550 kilometers. The DF-1 was produced in the 1960s and has long since been retired. The next Dongfang or DF-2 was a more improved missile with a range now out to 1,250 kilometers, and it could be loaded with a 15 to 20 kiloton nuclear warhead. China now had their first nuclear medium range ballistic missile. It was actually given a Western designation as well, called the CSS-1, standing for the China Surface to Surface Missile. This was almost a copy of the Russian counterpart, as it was very similar in appearance, payload, and engine. China would go on with the Dongfang program progressively, making it better and more deadly. One such game changer was the DF-11. The DF-11 was the first modern Chinese tactical ballistic missile launcher with a range of 300 kilometers. It was the first to be self-propelled, meaning it was mobile and not launched from a silo. This is the single most important capability for a rocket force, and I'll tell you why. At one point, during World War II, the German army began constructing a secret bunker at Le Couple that was not only hidden but heavily built up with concrete. The idea was that this James Bond villain-style underground base would be camouflaged into the landscape and could relentlessly fire V-2 rockets from it. This way Germany could attack London and the advancing Allied troops, with the Allies having no idea where the launch site was. But the thing is, German military brass was not keen on this idea. It was expensive and it would take too long to build. But more importantly, they knew the future of war wasn't big static bases. It was maneuver warfare. Staying mobile was the best defense. However, Nazi Germany was a dictatorship, so decisions about the military were made from the top down. They overruled the idea of mobile launchers, a decision that they would come to regret, because the Allied intelligence located this missile bunker, this concrete reinforced structure, before it even had a chance to fire off one V-2 rocket. It was destroyed. China learned their lessons from this, and they created a mobile DF-16 with a brand new state-of-the-art missile. It's a short-range surface-to-surface ballistic missile, or SRBM. The Western designation is the CSS-11. It has a maximum range of 1,000 kilometers. It's longer and wider than previous models, and it has an accuracy of 5 to 10 meters. It's about 7.8 meters long and has a diameter of 1.2 meters. It's an improvement over the DF-11, and the DF-15 has achieved 11 out of 11 test launches. The DF-16 is designed to fill a gap in China's arsenal by being able to hit static and slow-moving targets. The warhead has a varied delivery payload from 1,000 kilograms to 1,500 kilograms, and it's a two-stage solid-fuel missile. 
It has maneuver fire fins at its base, and the upper part guides it with its inertial navigation system, GPS, and also uses a terminal guidance system. And that's why China's rising satellite development is very important. They've launched 70% more satellites in the past five years than ever before to help with the navigation systems on these missile devices. The DF-16 can carry up to three warheads, which can carry HE, cluster munitions, and nuclear warheads. If loaded with three warheads, each one can be sent to attack a different target. It's launched from the vertical position. Its warheads do have room for improvement, which is unique to a lot of smart weapons, meaning in years to come, it can be upgraded. Reports suggest it could strike Taiwan in six to eight minutes, less than 10 minutes. And this kind of short timeline and little warning is the exact reason why the world was tied to these INF missile treaties in the past. Those short range missile treaties were designed to prevent nuclear attacks, which would happen in less than 10 minutes of warning. The idea being, if there's more warning time, then there's more time to abort and prevent the apocalypse. The PLA strategy is to use their rocket force to eliminate key targets early, such as radar, anti-aircraft systems, military bases, which would make way for their conventional forces to take the heavy lifting from there. It does appear though that the bulk of China's missile capability is aimed at deterring naval threats. We can all assume who they're thinking of here. It's us. The scary part of all of this is obvious. These missiles are designed to quickly swap the warheads from conventional explosives to nuclear capable. The warheads can be unitary, meaning large bombs, or multiple re-entry vehicles, meaning it can split up in midair and rain down multiple smaller bomblets. The warhead can also be designed to move in midair. We call this a re-entry vehicle because it's as if, you know, you could imagine it like someone's driving this missile on its way to the ground. This makes it near impossible to track and destroy, at least with modern technology. It does have enough range to reach Japan and the first island chain in the Pacific. A main point of concern is the DF-16 was specifically designed with the ability to evade interception by the Patriot Pac-3 SAM system and the THAAD system. The fact that China boasts about this seems like a real poke at America, as if it was made for us considering our past tactics of building up forces outside a border and then invading when it suits the United States military. Clearly, this new weapon should not be treated lightly. However, when tracking cons, there are some Achilles heels with the DF-16. One such disadvantage is the vehicle that carries the DF-16. It's called the WS-2500 TEL, Transporter Erector Launcher. It's based off of the DF-11 vehicle, basically a remake. It weighs 20 tons, just on its own with no missile. It can carry a driver plus seven crew. It comes at the eight by 10 and 10 by 10 wheelbases. The length is 5.5 meters and it has a width of 3.05 meters. Now, with those stats, some of you who do off-roading will know that this is a vehicle that's going to struggle on harsh off-roading driving, not to mention it will require a flat piece of ground to fire from. If you're gonna compare this to normal armored artillery, it takes some mobility hits as it lacks the ability to climb steep ground like tracked artillery. And if you look at the terrain down near east of China, it's very hilly. Also, we need to take into account the big missiles that are loaded onto the back. In doing the research for this video, I learned a little bit about rocket engineering, and well, basically, I doubt you can take a missile off-roading as every seal, every bolt, every electrical panel needs to be secure and factory mint unless you're gonna have problems firing it. This possibly may be a reason why some Russian missiles have been so inaccurate in Ukraine, possibly. Missiles tend to need loving care, and my point is, the PLA would most likely only be able to fire the DF-16 from roads or other flattened surfaces, meaning they would be very easy to find and predict where they would be to fire from. They also gave away some of their shooting locations when they fired them at Taiwan recently. Not taking into account the huge amount of smoke and heat that they give off, they're easy to spot. The only footage I've watched of the DF-16 being fired at Taiwan has been from launch sites in the middle of the road, in the middle of cities. Another disadvantage is that there are only 50 operational that's confirmed. Now they are large warheads, but there's not a huge amount of them. So they would only probably be able to fire them if they knew they could get a direct hit on something. There's also the fact that they have been designed to evade Patriot interception, but call me old school because 
When I look at those claims, they seem like just boasts to me. Looking back at history, there have been many times when a new weapon, vehicle, or tactic has made a poor showing. We shouldn't be overconfident, but that's just my personal view. There's also the bigger picture of China having not waged war in a very long time. This means there will be a huge lack of experience and knowledge of what to do in the PLA, especially if the Taiwan situation was to get hot. There would be a lot of moving parts in joint warfare. Something we can take away from our venture in the Middle East is America and its allies have gained a ton of knowledge of fighting in the modern era and how to combine new weapons with our capabilities. The PLA could struggle to really know what to do with the DF-16 and how to fit it into their doctrine and how it would evolve. You can use Russia as a good example of this, but I think the main disadvantage is its purpose. It seems the DF-16's sole purpose is to help bring Taiwan back to China whilst deterring the US. Something to take away is it seems the actual purpose is mainly a deterrent. So there's all kinds of surveillance systems that they would need to integrate at that range. Because when you increase the range of weapon systems, you also increase the need for surveillance and integrating that into your forces. So not much mentioned about China crushing enemies like their usual rhetoric with this weapon system. This does explain why it was designed to defeat American-made anti-air systems. The CCP tells us exactly what they're thinking on all of this. According to the PRC's 2019 defense white paper, the PLARF is working to quote, enhance its credible and reliable capabilities of nuclear deterrence and counterattack, strengthening immediate and long range precision strike forces and enhancing strategic counterbalance capability so as to build a strong and modernized rocket force. So what China's saying there is that they're trying to return the balance of power in the region by giving themselves more power to match the United States. China's President Xi Jinping is 100% behind the rocket force and largely responsible for its growth, saying it's meant to, quote, achieve a great rise in strategic capabilities, accelerate the PLARF's pace of development, and make enhanced breakthroughs in strategic deterrence capability. The missile we should also be keeping an eye on here is the DF-21, as it's the world's first anti-ship ballistic missile, dubbed the Carrier Killer. It's designed to target a moving carrier strike group. It's really hard to say if China's ballistic missiles are as big of a threat as we think they are, as none of them have been used in anger. So there's no solid concrete evidence to say if it will penetrate air defenses and do damage. But I want to know what you guys think of the DF-16. Are you scared of it? Let me know in the comments section. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, and you're watching Task and Purpose.